us today uh, Professor Anastasia Nesvatailova uh, from City University. Um, we also have our very own uh, Dr. Matt Eagleton Pierce from the Politics Department to act as discussant for um, Anastasia afterwards. Um, just a quick uh, speaker bio from me, and I will let the speaker uh, get started. Uh, Anastasia is a professor in international political economy at City University and director of City Political Economy Research Centre. Um, her main research interests lie in the political economy of finance, financial innovation and governance. Theore theoretically, she works at the nexus of post-Keynesian economic thought and the institutional economics of J.R. Commons and Hyman Minsky. In 2015, Anastasia was appointed a member of the economic advisory panel to the shadow chancellor, John McDonnell, and her most recent book, Financial Alchemy in Crisis, The Great Liquidity <coughs> Illusion, uh, 2010 focuses on the role of liquidity in finance, showing that the seeming liquidity that led to an abundance of mortgages in the US and UK housing market never actually existed. She explains why the credit crisis was inevitable, an inevitable consequence of the uh, created credit pyramid. Um, and so, without further ado, I will hand over to Anastasia, who will speak for around 45 minutes, and then to Matt, and then to the audience. Okay, so now you position me where you want me to be. <laughs> Brilliant. And you can hear me, yes? Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the fantastic invitation for this audience that is still interested in something not necessarily to do with the direct remit of Oriental or African studies, although some themes overlap. And thank you for Matthew to agree to discuss my paper. Um, I will have to say that... Uh, There is no particular theoretical framework that I would want to put forward to you. I'm not proving a particular hypothesis. I'm just laying out the state of affairs and some dilemmas that confront um, an authoritarian leader of a quite a complex country. Um, and towards the end, I, I will have a, a three scenarios of a potential development or a resolution of the current situation. Before I start, this is me. No, you better look at him. Um, you already know who I am. Uh, before I start, I have to introduce the species. Um, Russia in the literature, clearly as a political economist, you analyze either capitalism or a state market relationship. What is interesting is that in the academic literature, the Russian state has been known to be a modern state. It has a constitution, it has a division of powers, it has a, a relatively de developed set of institutions that represent a democracy. It is known as an oligarchic state, as a state that was made for oligarchs, that was made by oligarchs, that is now governed by a different type of oligarchs. It is also known as a mafia state. It's actually a term used recently by one American scholar who associated with the personal um, role of President Putin and his, and his connections and the connections of his entourage to essentially mafia networks or organized crime, most of them centered on security channels and KGB. Um, uh, crony capitalism, one description, sovereign democracy, another description, petrostate, an, um, a third description. And although um, we can debate every virtue of, this con of each of these concepts, one lesson that comes out of a good analysis of the institutions, the demography, the political economy of Russia is this. Russia is not a classic petrostate. It's not a monarchy. It's not a, a Middle Eastern or a Gulf state. It has a very developed institutional framework. It has dem um, um, interesting demographics. It has diverse, diversified, diversified labor, force, labor force. It has very educated uh, population. But always and everywhere for the past 20th century, its key dilemma was how to overturn its dependence on oil or oil experts more specifically. And this is the dilemma. So although this is kind of always a strategic um, ghost um, haunting any leader, to be honest, if you start looking inside the Russian economy, it's, as I'm saying, it's not a petrostate. And there is an institutional and social and political framework that makes things evolve in a ways that are not necessarily um, coincide with predictions of major forecasters or policymakers or politicians who want to deal with Russia on the international stage. So let's roll. 
The common story of the current crisis, and there is no denying of the fact that Russia has been in crisis since 2014, if not since 2012, is something like this. Um, the glory years of uh, Vladimir Putin and his first two uh, terms in power coincided with the windfall of oil revenues. Um, and during that oil windfall, his regime, um, his partners in, in power, globally expanded Russia's geopolitical and foreign policy ambitions. In 2003, he was himself mentioning Russia joining NATO. In 2007, um, there was a talk of a big Eurasian Union that was stretched from uh, Lisbon to Vladivostok. Okay, so the, the rhetoric of Russia being a global player was very much not, not against and not as a counterpart, not a counterpoint, not as a reactionary to existing power structure, but very much as a member of maybe a potential partner, but very much, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very friendly, if you want, very liberal discourse of, of geopolitical um, choice. Um, at the same time, sometime around 2008, 2009, certainly reinforced by 2012 uh, presidential re-election re of Putin into his third term, um, things coincided, domestic shifts in power, shrinking revenues from oil rent, um, you know, certain mar marginal changes in satisfaction of the new generation of oligarchs. They coincided with Russia feeling betrayed by the West in several of foreign policy um, um, adventures, in particular in Libya, uh, and it goes back to, you know, Reagan and George Bush uh, Jr., who once had signed particular treaties, they never really fulfilled it. NATO is expanding to, um, you know, essentially to the border of Belarus. So it all makes the liberal clans in Russia a little bit less secure, and it makes the Siloviki, the, 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 the power and security and the military forces, a little bit more aggressive. So around 2012, um, just as the Libya deal was mishandled, as far as Russia is concerned, by the West. Um, the Slovaki part of the power entourage or power clan inside Russia said, okay, that's enough. We have had enough of experimentation with, with being a junior partner or an aspiring partner to this global order. Let's take things into our own hands and show them what we can do. And specifically, if you're interested, the, the issue over Libya was that Russia agreed to a no-fly zone of intervention, whilst in reality the operation quickly became um, a much more grand offensive uh, and a regime change. So, uh, since 2012, there is an active building of something called the Eurasian Union, um, which I don't have the map, but it's basically, it's a little bit of a re reincarnation of the Soviet Union, minus the Baltics and minus some of the Central Asian states. The active participants in it are um, Russia, Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Kyrgyzstan. Apparently New Zealand wanted to join. Um, but of course the, the Eurasian bit, the Euro bit here, um, had a jam, and that particular jam was Ukraine. Um, the largest of the Slavic republics apart from Russia, with access to the West and, and to the sea. Um, at the last point, this didn't work out. It worked out in, in a very different way to the dissatisfaction of Russia. And ever since then, Russian aggression towards the Ukraine and, and the Crimea thing has been punished by diplomatic um, tools. The rationale behind the sanctions, which um, in addition to lower oil revenues, remain the key financial weapon of, um, of well, let's say, the West, the European Union and, and the United States, uh, is very simple. Um, and you can find quotes uh, about it in New York Times and some speeches of, of people who were working for Obama, is that the oil-dependent Russian economy cannot withstand uh, the economic pressure of A, international financial isolation, and B, lower oil revenues. And over time, the power base um, of the current regime in the Kremlin will collapse. Um, that was very much, you know, almost word for word up there in 2014. And the calculation um, is this. This is Russian export, <coughs> and if you can see the, can I point? Yeah, I can point. These are hydrocarbons. The, about 74% of whatever Russia supplies to the world markets is oil, gas, and other 
burnable stuff. Um, the rest is minuscule with a little bit of chemicals, a little bit of 4% of machinery, and only 1% of food and grains. This is the country with the largest territory in the world. Um, and I, I took the statistics before the Ukrainian conflict, before the sanctions. So the calculation is clearly kind of makes a lot of sense. So yes, oil and gas, a, a major export item, very crucial for budget revenues. They compile about 50% of overall budget revenues into the state. Um, and therefore, eventually it will eat into the existing support for this annoying regime in the Kremlin. My point to, to this relatively mainstream debate is this. Russia's fragility is, first of all, not even about oil as such. Um, what happened is that under the years of two Putin, Putin's reign since 2002 up until today, Russia developed quite a sophisticated network of subsidies, transfer, transfers and institutional support it's essentially fiscal to the regions that um, makes its economy relatively diversified. Oil and gas employ very few people proportionately. Um, and although they are major contributors to um, budget revenues, structurally, it's not an, an, a very employing economic sector. So instead, I focus, there is a paper background that Matthew has printed out. I, I focus instead not just on oil or energy dependence, but on three key areas of Russia's mode of international integration. One is the exporting or rather export input mode of the country. So the second one is uh, the word that I kind of don't you know, I'm skeptical about the virtue, but let's call it financialization. And uh, up until recently, it has acted as a boost to aggregate demand and consumption. And number three is a specific and unique mode of integration into the world financial network, the, the dominance of offshore in channeling money into Russia and channeling money out of Russia. Offshore, I mean tax havens. So this is the point that is supposed to illustrate my most conceptual, kind of my, my most deep insight, is that Russia is not just about oil. This is the structure of the country's GDP sector by sector. And you can see where is oil here. Now it doesn't work. But essentially, if you read carefully through various subheadings, you will see that this is quite an advanced you know, service-based economy with um, transfers, with contributions to budget, with drains on the budget. But really, this is definitely not um, a very skewed petrostate. Although nobody will deny almost one-to-one -one correlation of the Russian ruble to the Brent oil crude price in the world markets. And this is specifically the graph that illustrates Russian GDP as a blue line, and the yellow line is the world price for Brent crude um, that Russia exports. And you can see they move in, in very nice correlation up until now. Okay, to counteract, or as a lesson from its previous crisis, and the latest crisis before 2014, or before even 2009, was the 1998 default. And since then, the Russian policymakers have learned their lesson. The lesson was that it's stupid to keep the exchange rate fixed. It encourages um, a lot of unnecessary risk and also ha ties the hands of the central bank. And B, you need to have foreign reserves to be able to, to do strategic stuff in the rainy day. So they've used the first two, 10 years or 12 years of Putin's reign to accumulate those reserves. They're split across three various funds. One is the normal reserves of the central bank, another two are strategic funds. They're, they're designed for national welfare and national uh, prosperity or national reserve fund. Uh, they have been used during the recent crisis and um, I, I saw that a, a, a large chunk of withdrawal from one of them just happened in the, in the last few months to, to compensate for fiscal deficit. But they are still there, apart from, well, the sovereign buffers are kind of in the central bank are, are draining, but the two strategic funds are still there. Um, this is the central bank reserves. It's been dwindle, dwindling down towards the end of 2015. And sometime, I think it was the, uh, let me remember, it was 2015 when the governor of the central bank decides that we are no longer have a packed exchange rate. We let it float and the ruble crushed. 
and it very much kind of it appreciated a little bit back, but it still is very much lower than uh, what it was in the glory years of Vladimir Putin. I have to apologize for this particular graph because I was doing it manually and it's back to front and I don't know how to reverse it. So you have to read it kind of in Arabic Hebrew way from right to left. So it starts from 2008 and finishes with 15. And you can see this is the early days of post-crisis recovery. Then it goes up in correlating with you know, super oil revenues. And then, and then it starts dwindling a little bit towards the current crisis, but it's still very much there. This is the National Welfare or Wealth Fund. Sometimes it's kind of used for naughty purposes to support a particular corporation or state corporation that is too friendly. Um, but essentially, this is the state reserve that um, is there for the state to to support population on the rainy day. All this suggests that the current, let's call it still crisis, but just it could be stagnation or recession, would not follow this um, V pattern. This V pattern was deep, and it, it coincided with 2008 and 2009, but the country quickly recovered already towards 2010. What is happening now is that you see already dwindling growth from about 2012 onwards. And now this, this particular line will be either fluctuating, fluctuating around zero, and I read today the latest statistics. Putin, sorry, Putin himself projected that the GDP will shrink by 0.3% uh, this year only. So this suggests that, in fact, you, you're no longer in, an, in another crisis. This is a period for a country to um, confront its demons, if you want, and it's a period of a much longer stagnation and possibly reorganization politically. Another weakness is um, not just the exports, it's the what is happening inside. And in particular, it's the pattern, um, it's not even the pattern, Russia imports everything, or at least up until the sanctions, it was importing everything. In certain industries, the share of imports reached 70 to 90 percent. Uh, the example that circulates around in the commentario to analytical stuff is that if you buy a tin, a, a food, a, a, a tin, whatever, a, a, a can of tin, a can of food tinned in Russia <laughs> or Russian food, and 90 percent of that tin will be imported, including the paper app with a nice logo and pictures, because apparently the Russian economy cannot really cope with such sophisticated technology. Um, of course, when, you know, it was easy and cheap to borrow, you borrowed. And um, if it's too risky to reorganize your production inside and invest, you don't really. And instead, you exploit the same reserves, oil reserves, gas reserves, and the same facilities um, that was there even in Soviet times. So kind of Russia went into the 2014 crisis with a very skewed balance exporting the burnables um, and importing pretty much everything else, even including in stuff produced in Russia, very much like what is happening with Brexit or we discover that is happening with Brexit. Even for Russia made goods, the ingredients would be imported, especially on technology and you know high tech. So um, Alexei Kudrin, who once was a minister of finance, now he's a kind of chosen leader of the liberal economic opposition. Uh, officially chosen, he's a system opposition, says that essentially there is a model of growth. You cannot say that there isn't, uh, and it's not just an ad hoc channeling of oil. It's a model where oil exports and revenues from oil exports are being used to um, facilitate aggregate demand. And there was a big consumption boom, there was a big building boom, there was a big consumer boom, and a credit bubble inside Russia already evident in 2012-2013 nothing to do with the sanctions. At the same time, what happened with high oil revenues is that the presence of the state and the state-centric economy expanded massively. When you asked graduates, even in early 2014, where would you like your future job to be? Uh, most of them wanted to work somewhere in a state bureaucracy or a state corporation, kind of the big network of state-linked things. Now when you ask them, I think every second or fourth of them actually wants to leave the country. But at that time, the choice was to work for the state, not really for the private sector, certainly not, not to start something new. 
What also is happening is that the expansion of the state, uh, of course, leads people. And they, um, overall, the kind of, it's not just civil service, it's everything has expanded massively um, since, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, but it has grown twofold compared with staff uh, engaged in research and development in, for example, academia or higher education. By the way, so I, I probably don't see. The purple line is civil servants excluding army and security services. Okay, so army and KGB, FSB, anything to do with any other security doesn't count. This is just pure sort of bureaucracy, civil service. They started at 121 in 1995, already post-Soviet Union, already under Yeltsin. And they gradually diverged. So this is the human capital or the intellectual capital with which Russia confronted the crisis. So stuff in R&D is this, what is it, under 800, and almost twofold is the kind of the, the big people employed for the state, by the state, or near the state. The beautiful economic trick of this, I don't know how many of you are economists, is that, of course, if you are employed somewhere around the state or near state channels, your currency is in rubles. So you don't really care, or you know, politicians don't care how you react to devaluation of the ruble. You no, know, you just you, you, you get rubles. So you don't go on foreign travel, or you don't send your children to international institutions or, or summer camps, um, and it allows them to keep employment. So as real income shrinks, but you don't lose the job. So unemployment in Russia is uniquely, um, or actually consistently low, partly because of demographics. All this is uh, stapled together by interesting social contract between the political elites, the, ru the ruling elites, um, if you want, the oil elites, the petrol elites, and, and the society. The contract, uh, in a very non-sophisticated and atheoretical terms, sounds something like this. They, the elites, and this can be anything, the original oligarchs from the 90s, the first generation of let's say, St. Petersburg, Stiloviki uh, oligarchs that came with Putin in, in, two, in early 2000s, all the new generation, okay, essentially their children, the, the more technocratically oriented third generation of all this, um, maintain power by enriching themselves. Um, they steal, everybody knows they do, but that's fine. Um, and diverting resources, but they do it in the name of the state. And that's fine. Because, as one member of my family told me when I kind of presented some arguments to him, well, that's okay, at least they do it for the state. They made the country great again. Ordinary Russians got wealthier um, in the first 10 years or 12 years of Putin's reign. Um, massively wealthier. This is unprecedented. They do not remember life as good ever. Their parents still remember Soviet deficits. Their grandparents, you know, they're still scared of, you know, the post-war... Um, no adjustments, but nowhere, you know, Russians were part of the global middle class. You cannot really distinguish them if you're on Alpine ski slope. They look exactly the same, possibly with more colorful clothing. Um, and they share the patriotic life, but importantly, do not engage in active politics. In fact, the, the, the only time they tried to do it in uh, 2012, when Putin's third re-election was accepted reluctantly, or some people didn't accept it, turned out to be very painful for many of them. So this is the social contract. Uh, academic literature suggests that um, there are more clever terms for this. Uh, there is one term comes from Richard Sakwa, who works in Kent, um, and he calls it a shadow state. He basically says that there are sort of two structure, two functioning structures of the state in Russia. First, the formal, constitutional, modern state, with all the normal divisions of powers, checks and balances, the separation of the executive and, and, the, and the legislator. Um, at the same time, there are shadow stru state structures to do with you know, so signals and le leverage and tools that are used by the administrative resource, by the Siloviki, for a particular distribution of resources, but they are unseen, they are kind of there, up um, you know, in the background. Another person who writes about one aspect of the social contract is Alena Ledinova at UCL, and your sister sees across the kind of road, and she calls it Sistema. And Sistema is a, it's a vertical of power. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very similar but more sociological interpretation. It's a vertical of power where a lot of channels of administrative pressure 
um, a lot of leverage gained through uh, particular apparatuses used to, um, you know, send power signals. It's it's very, it's understandable but not articulated. So everybody knows it's there, but nobody is really prepared to pin it down or or indeed challenge it. Instead, they use it, and this is my kind of. Um, artistic take on the state of affairs, but please forgive me. We're moving to this. So this is the kind of the political economy and the social contract. So weak, however diversified, in which the state has grown and state interest has grown, but also potential divisions and conflicts, even within the oligarchic elite, for example, or the state centric elite, um, are potentially higher because resources are dwindling. With lower oil prices, your rent is actually lower. Financialization came um, as part of globalization and contributed to that feeling that Russians have never really been wealthier than, for example, in 2007 or 2000, early 2008. There's been a, a massive credit boom fueled partly by thousands of Russian banks, and Russia has thousands of banks. Most of them are useless. And they lose their licenses, you know, by, by the dozen overnight because they are either corrupt or they steal money or they're used for somebody's enrichment. But it's not an, a, a very efficient banking system. Still, because big banks had access to international funding, that helped um, fuel the lending boom inside. And Russians borrowed. They borrowed to own a new house. They borrowed to own a new mobile phone. They borrowed just to borrow. Um, and so, for example, there was a, an outstanding, what is it, in, indebtedness from 10% to 40% of GDP. Nothing extraordinary by international standards, but significant in historical terms for us. Uh, interestingly, at the peak of, um, you know, the idea that Russia is a great power again, and we can afford it, and, you know, this is the new economic miracle, about 30% of all loans were in foreign currency, in dollars. And middle classes, actually, they were borrowing in dollars to own a flat. Of course, it will crash in 2014. And these, you know, foreign, foreign currency mortgage holders would be very, very unhappy and express their dissatisfaction. And again, in 2012, there were, you know, a relatively modest share of unsecured loans to, um, to households at 9% of GDP. Uh, nothing, again, nothing dramatic by international standards but dramatic enough for a relatively fragile and concentrated banking system that would now have the sledgehammer of international sanctions. The banks would not have access to international funding. They will be simply cut off. So as a reaction to that, they will have to roll back some lending, they will have to call in the delinquencies, and bankruptcies would, would rise. One casualty, and by no means a, a last one, in fact, it was one of the first ones or the biggest, is somebody called Trust Bank, Tell it, the name tells for itself, and they had enough cash resource to pay Bruce Willis to be the front man for this. So they actually went bankrupt, I think, in December 2015. Uh, but again, it was one of the many early birds of a, of a bigger storm to come. So the Russian banking system was really hammered by the crisis, but the weaknesses there had been brewing up since a uh, since long time before. At the same time, although Russians borrowed for consumer protection, for, for consumer consumption, for mortgages, as a, as a fixed capital or as capital into, uh, as investment into fixed capital, sorry, this is in Kyrillic, but essentially um, nobody was investing. Um, this, the grain line is the overall volume of um, investment into fixed capital. Um, the orange one is excluding the seasonal factor, and basically the thick line is the trend. It's been basically going down and or stagnating. Some infrastructure projects, which are so beloved by politicians because they're very socially friendly, are being done, but then some of them have absolutely no logical rationale. Why do you build a very expensive bridge between, for example, two remote islands? if very few people actually live there and there's practically no economic activity in either of the islands. So clearly this could be interpreted as part of the arrangement for their you know, friends or, um, or colleagues who are very close because they got the contract, they want the tender, they are diverting the resources from the main you know, federal uh, grant. Um, but you know, some of these bridges were built, um, but many roads remain unrepaired. And finally, 
what about other sources of capital? You know, Russians got rich, so surely they should be able to invest in the economy. They do. This is the country, this is the list of FDI flows into Russia by country of origin. And you can see that number one here in 2012 and 2001 is something called Cyprus. Number two is um, BVI, British Virgin Island. Um, number three is the Netherlands and then Ireland. All major tax haven jurisdictions with Cyprus being the first stop to have an, an envelope of shell companies where essentially Russian capital exits, cleans itself out and then comes back. Another graph would illustrate to you almost a one-to-one -one relationship between the money coming out of the country and money coming into the country. So this is, uh, this is 2011, presumably a, a, a quite a, a benign year. So um, FDI into Russia, first Cyprus, FDI out of Russia, Cyprus, the number matches almost to the dot. Then Netherlands and then the BVI. So the first, f the first three is the same, then it breaks into Bermuda, Bahamas, but Switzerland and Luxembourg channel money back into the country. Um, how are they doing it? This is one common scheme. A Russian company belongs to a Cyprus mother. The Cyprus mother gives its Russian daughter a loan, and this loan is fake, no, it's just a particular contract, or something that needs receivables. It could be a right, a royalty, or a license, or permission. Then the Russian daughter, the Russian company, sells actual products in the Russian market where the actual economic activity takes place and earns revenue. However, most part of this revenue goes to, pay, goes to paying off the Cyprus mother because, of course, there was a loan, and the loan needs to be pay, paid back, either as an interest or as an interest as, and payment or as a fee for whatever activity was licensed. As a result, the net profit from the Russian daughter is minimal, whereas most of the sum goes to Cyprus. Of course, it's not taxed by the Russian state. Another scheme is through exports. A Russian company sells products to a Cyprus firm at a low price. No products actually change their physical location, but there is a paper trail. The Cyprus company, in, in turn, sells products to the final cons customer at a higher price. No products change place between the three jurisdictions, but there is a paperwork showing that now there is more money sort of under the Cyprus ownership. In reality, these are only recorded paper transactions. The products actually go directly from the Russian consumer to the Russian firm, um, but they, they are not taxed by the Russian authorities. Uh, offshore jurisdictions also have helped people to avoid the sanctions. Um, this is one scheme put up together by The Economist as to how um, one of the first banks that got sanctioned, uh, apparently close to Putin, um, essentially how cleverly they, sh they, they distributed the ownership and because of the tricks in, in particular ratio of ownership, they are now not part, of, part or under the sanctions. I have to say that Putin declared a, a massive de-offshoreization de campaign in the country. Um, it concerns civil servants, their relatives, family members, uh, and anybody who wants to conduct business. Um, it's been moderately successful. Some people have declared their tax returns, but also people quickly understood that, you know, there are ways to have a particular seasonal tax residence in Russia and then to be outside of the country for most of the time. Then you don't, you don't fall under the new regime. So the dilemmas of all this is that the main instrument so far for addressing this kind of the, the political economic crisis um, have been Russia's sovereign wealth funds. These reserves are prone to being depleted, but some are still there. And some painful choices about which industries to support, for example, which firms, which sectors, which owners, uh, will have to be met. Um, the decisions will produce, and in fact, they're already producing their own winners and losers, uh, and may add to the already present drifts in the ruling elites around the Kremlin. And if there are any Russian watchers who are following what's going on, there, is, there has been quite a massive reorganization of some of the key figures, both in the Siloviki clan and the kind of liberal economic clan, most famously with the arrest of the Minister for Economic Development for a bribery of $2 million last week. Um, quite an extraordinary development. I don't remember ministers, actually. I know governors were being arrested. I know some are in jail, but a Minister for Economic Development one of the liberals, one of those who are inherited from the initial perestroika, not perestroika, but the Yeltsin team, um, is now under, I think, house arrest. 
Um, yes, I said already deoffshoreization. De um, the deepening financial crisis is deepening. It's, uh, it's, it's not been helped by a very strict and, and severe stance by the central bank, who is using any opportunity to clean out the system um, from you know, inefficient or corrupt or fraudulent elements. In fact, they do raids at night um, that, you know, so that nobody can trade inside information on, to hide something. So a team from the central bank would arrive in your bank office or in your bank affiliate at night, sees everything, and in the morning you'd learn that your license has been revoked. In fact, the only element of the Russian economy, um, apart from kind of access to offshore, though it's, it, it's also a little bit undermined by the global pressures against tax havens, remains the relatively robust social contract between the ruling elites and the population. What is interesting is that I keep saying that the elites themselves are quite divided. Um, so when you, when you want to see kind of the more, this is the Siloviki clan, but then, of course, Putin's closest ally, Medvedev, the prime minister, is supposed to be the, the more neoliberally minded, economically um, progressive uh, person who is in charge of actual implementation of economic reform and stabilization packages. So there are the rifts between them always existed. They intensified around 2012. And you can see how Essentially, Putin is not really a dictator or you know, a, a tsar. He serves as an arbiter between the two clans. And usually it's a, it's a check, chess game of you know, punishing somebody from one side and then giving something to another side. Um, but that's about domestic politics. I'm, I'm happy to go into questions. So with these divisions around the elites, with the structural economic weaknesses inside, and with the no, still a robust, robust social contract between the elites, Putin and, and the population, I see three scenarios developing in the near to medium term. Let's start with long term. And this was preoccupying a lot of people back in 2014, um, especially as Russia seemed to intensify the isolationist rhetoric and you know, a pivot away from the West. Um, Russia is supposedly developing a new type of friendship and collaborative relationship with the Chinese. It is saved by China and it becomes a satellite of China, a resource satellite and a territory satellite. This merger starts a global realignment of powers and geopolitics. I'm quite skeptical about this particular uh, vector, although it's clear that China is an important regional presence and it's very important financially, for example, in Central Asian economies. Um, it also has its own ambitions for some of the territories and resources, but it would not be an alliance of equals. It will always go um, according to you know, Chinese demands because they prove to be much shrewder negotiators. The famous gas pipeline from you know, one of the Siberian cities to China, still I think it hasn't taken off because the Chinese are very reluctant. And it's, um, it will actually be quite unprofitable for Russia. And once I read that the estimate is that it will take 30 years for the pipeline to actually turn profitable. So, um, and also in terms of, you know, all this pivot away from the West, the BRICS become a new player. There is very little coherence around the BRICS overall and even between Russia and China. There is more than disunites them than there is that unites, especially in the collective vision of, let's say, soft power, hard power, or, or even multilateralism projected to the world stage. Scenario two, short term. The Kremlin attempts to resolve economic crisis by entering into another war conflict. By, you know, this was written, you know, I have to say, I left my fresh USB stick in the office, so this is, uh, this is a little bit uh, behind. So clearly, the Kremlin is using um, uh, an external conflict fueled by military or security considerations to essentially divert attention away from the economic or social problems. Um, there have been some speculations that there will be an internal rift with security um, or national militia, but Syria came to rescue, and the big gamble is, of course, under Trump, what will happen, and my calculation is that um, Putin will try to, to get the sanctions lifted in exchange for you know, partnership around Syria. And Assad will stay. Scenario three, long term. Uh, Russia returns to the Western fold and uh, a modernization path because any historian will tell you that any progressive modernization, any sort of economic reform and any move towards enlightenment only came to Russia from interaction with Europe 
and not from any partnership with the East or China. This can be the outcome of Putin remaining leader or not. And on this provocation, I, will, I guess I will end. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Matt, but before I do, I forgot to say earlier, if any of you would like to tweet about uh, today's event, the hashtag to use is uh, SOAS Dev Studies. Um, so, okay, handing over to Matt. Great, thank you. Thank you, Nithya, and uh, delighted to be a part of this uh, development seminar series. And um, it's wonderful just to offer some initial thoughts on Anastasia's uh, presentation and I'm uh, really pleased to be a discussant on this. I've read a number of uh, pieces of uh, uh, your work in, in terms of uh, work on financialization, the shadow banking system in particular, uh, and I'm with you on the importance of Minsky and uh, wider questions that you've studied on, uh, on governance. Uh, I'm not a Russianist though, so my remarks are, are not going to be as, uh, as informative and as, uh, as penetrating as Anastasia's has, has presented to you. But I hope that it will offer some, some avenues and uh, some prospects uh, in terms of the debate. Um, I think overall, I think that this, I was, that this offers a really valuable corrective on some of the conventional depictions on Russia in its uh, ongoing financial crisis and more broadly in relation to its political economy in general. And um, as uh, she outlined, it contests the common narrative that by arguing that the major source of structural vulnerability for Moscow lies not just simply in the volatility of hydrocarbons, but is also how the economy has become financialized and how that is, uh, has uh, cross-border uh, effects. And uh, I think that it prosecutes this very well, as you've seen, in terms of going through the relevant data, political problems about redistribution of export revenues, uh, increased role of the state, all, all the way through to these processes and effects of financialization. So my uh, follow-ups and uh, further thoughts are grouped around uh, five sets of points, which uh, uh, some are directly on, on, the, on the paper and then the others are hopefully kind of spinning off from it. So one was... Uh, on the, uh, the points that were raised about the diversification and the overall structure of the economy. And, um, and you, speak about, you spoke about how the, there have been moves towards diversification, and you, the, uh, one of your comments was on how um, you know, that there, is, there has been attempts at this. But my question was, you know, why have, have there not been, I mean, notwithstanding what you're saying in terms of the uh, it, the, the structure in terms of the contribution to GDP in terms of sectors, but why have there still not been more efforts, or should one ex should one have expected more efforts at, di at diversification um, and reducing dependence on imports as a way to to, to enhance that? Um, the second theme, and I think this really comes out really great in, in the paper, is this fascinating story of the capital flight and the offshore nexus of Russian investments. And uh, I thought that was all in, intriguing, those strategies that we use there. Um, one question I had on this was just coming back to more of the question of the, the awareness and monitoring of this. Uh, and you speak about how Putin has been installing this anti-offshore law drive. But again, it's a, a question of, um, you know, and you say that it's kind of had some degree of moderate effect, but you know, perhaps you just elaborate a little bit more on, on, on you know, are there alternative uh, politics going on uh, underneath that, or is, or is, you know, is that the, is that the stated goal at all times? Um, a third point, I think, was just some, something which, something which you didn't have in, in the paper, which was, I thought was uh, something that perhaps you could comment on, is the relationship between land and financialization. Um, and, you know, in your paper you, you made the point about how some of the uh, Russian capital is channeled off offshore, finds its way to, for instance, property in, in London and elsewhere and so forth. Uh, but do you have anything in terms of how there has been significant reform of domestic farm land or land grabbing? I was just wondering whether you had 
is that is that of it an interest to to your story in any way, or would you say that that's you know, not as significant in relation to the, the larger story you're trying to tell? So I'm just intrigued about how we can understand the relationship between land and financialization. Um, and fourth uh, is just turning towards the the forecasts and the scenarios you you, you map out, and this is kind of uh, you had a, a few ad libs uh, on on this. Um, I was just wondering about the the banking sector again, uh, and do you think that there is is there some relative stability that has emerged as the banking sector, or is this still an illusion, and is it, is it still vulnerable in a, in an environment of uh, of low growth and external vulnerabilities? And a, a final point is more is a more general one. Whenever whenever I uh, you know looking and trying to, to, try to decipher Russia, I, I just come back again to how can we understand um, different strategies of power in, in trying to make sense of Russia. So uh, on, on this, I was wondering, out of your studies of contemporary Russia, do you think that you've discerned anything about how we can understand power and power strategies more generally as a as a way in which we can see patterns in political behavior. Um, I'm just thinking about how difficult it is for, 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 for observers of Putin to, to accurately judge uh, his intentions. And one technique of power is to be, um, to be unstable, to, to, to turn the other way, to be unpredictable. And so I was just wondering whether, you know, it, it, can we learn anything more generally about power strategies for your case? Straight, wow. Um, okay, diversification moves towards possibly the easiest of the questions that you, Matthew, asked. Thank you very much. Um, of course, only an idiot, uh, if he, or well, when he uh, is elected into power, doesn't want to diversify the economy and has been part of official governmental programs ever since probably 1999 at least. Um, why not more moves? Uh, why? It was much cheaper to, uh, you know, bleed the two veins, gas and oil, um, and it's also much cheaper to actually import. The ruble was overvalued, uh, you know, officially maintained, again prompted by revenues. Um, it's not to say that, you know, it, it's an entire, entirely a story of economic collapse. If you go into, into, if you go on Amazon, you can buy some of the Russian cosmetics. It's organic, produced in Siberia. It's very good. Um, you know, shampoos included. Uh, you can buy some very nice uh, le leather, uh, natural children's footwear. Unfortunately, you cannot easily import it into UK, but it's there. So there are some pockets. Of course, there is Kaspersky. Uh, there are some pockets of you know some hope and excellence, but they are you know the exceptions rather than the rule. But the big uh, incentive is why you know if you have this vast apparatus that already works, okay? So the mechanism of control, subsidies, transfers, it works. It belongs to the state or it's near the state or it's a state corporation. Um, and you also you know, know clearly it requires some sort of, it requires greater presence of private ownership. And private ownership, although the very foundation of capitalism, is quite dangerous in Russia. <laughs> Things can be taken away from you if you're a private owner. So as a as this very banal incentive to, you know, you know, let's do it, let's let's recreate a new incentive structure and let's work it. It doesn't really work because of the, you know, it's a regime, it's corruption, it's the existing facilities that are already out there. So overall, the balance of things didn't really work until the sanctions. What the sanctions did is that they turned some of the import dependency into an opportunity. So one of the few sectors that grew since 2014 is um, agriculture. Suddenly, Russians realize they can eat Russian apples and not necessarily Polish. It seems to be okay. Um, they start to sell more to the near abroad. And pharmaceuticals, that's another sector that's sort of... Uh, and there are also some regions with, with relatively you know, advanced to, to the Russian extent infrastructure that have really benefited from this artificial... It's not even the sanctions, it's the counter sanctions that protected, that served as protectionist measure. Um, and everybody seems to you know, essentially like them. The counter sanctions worked worked well for the Russian economy, but the financial sanctions and technology sanctions imposed on 
banks and corporations don't really work. Or worked, but you know, to to the loss of the Russians. Um, capital flight awareness monitoring. I can say, you know, it's a, it's difficult because it's so deeply entrained. The main motive for Western capital flight, when you have the use of offshore here, is essentially you evade or split your profits. You you fragment your jurisdiction so that you're not taxed in a particular high level um, jurisdiction. In Russia, the main motivation for using offshore zones is the concealment of the true ownership because nobody wants to declare what they have. It's not so much about paying taxes, it's about hiding what you have or your wife or your niece has. So I, I think there is some understanding in the business or you know bureaucratic community that the Kremlin is using it as, a, as an extra tool of control, so that now everybody will declare whatever they have and it will be another leverage instrument to, to play around um, between competing fractions. Land and financialization, I, I, I don't have anything to say on that, apart from the, the first argument that it's also a little bit probably dangerous to own a particular type of land. And also, you know, it's still an abundant resource in Russia. You know, let's say if you want, what do you do with it? So you have a piece of Siberia, but unless you have investment flowing in, you know, it's, it's a bit useless. Um, banking sector, relative stability. Um, I think there is a big stability that is uh, kind of a mirror image of Western stability. The retail banking is essentially state-backed. Uh, the biggest bank belongs is Sberbank. It's a it's, uh, state-owned <coughs> payment system to do, again, as a response to initial imp imposition of sanctions, has been built as a, as a Russian network, not reliant so much on, on private Western companies. Um, so there is some stability to that, and some Russians are still trusting their savings to the state bank. But as, a, as an area of activity, as this part of the service economy, are still they haven't, you know, there's been massive cleansing of the system. I'm not sure all the potential for fraud and corruption have, have been chucked out, but it's, you know, it's been going on for at least three years. Strategies of power, yeah, wow. Um, I th the key distinction possibly would be between Putin or you know, the regime, the Kremlin using tactics vis-a-vis -vis strategy. And there is a lot of confusion in the West because uh, very clever tactics are confused for strategy, whereas in reality, this, you know, there is actually no strategy. When they talk about soft power, um, a Russian vision of a world order, a Russian counterpoint to the West, it's actually nothing. There is no coherent uh, ideological, political vision for a new, better world. Whatever they can offer on RT24 or whatever it's called, it's essentially it's a counterpoint to what it's there. It's a reacting. It's a very reactionary, um, and not that it's not entertaining, but essentially it's a, it's always a, a reactive and therefore passive response. Um, possibly you can say that about a lot of BRICS countries. Whereas on tactics, the key you you, see, you know create uncertainty, instability, meddle. Um, that's great. That works. Um, I think it works also in domestic um, politics to generate certain fears or you know, uh, protect or expose certain weaknesses. Um, and I would not be af afraid to say that some of it is pure sabotage of each other in terms of business rivalries or you know, political factions. They often play against it, each other. And there have been cases in, in recent history where, let's say, there are two uh, big um, what is it called, um, you know, lords controlling the security apparatus, they start a public war between themselves and then Putin sex both because in, in their uh, war against each other they destroyed the reputation of both of, um, and so both ended up outside the political sphere. So that's what my take is on soft and hard. Thank you very much. Um, can I have a show of hands for questions, see if we want to group them together? Yes, let's start by doing that. So, gentlemen over here, please. OK, 
Okay, great. Uh, so I hand somewhere around to ask this gentleman. Should we take one more question for uh, Colon Alfredo? Okay, great. What's it? Yes. Uh, Estonia, my personal uh, answer is, uh, I guess you already said it's an irrational fear, and I completely agree. Um, I don't see uh, Russia going on adventure in any of the Baltic states. It has absolutely no business there, and it's expensive, and you know, Putin actually doesn't like uncertainty or Reports suggest that when when Brexit happened and you know his soldiers came and said, "Oh, you know Brexit, you know we've done it," he said, "You idiots, do you realize that you know this will this will be very terminous and uncertain?" Um, so no, but there are um, in my native Belarus or Moldova or other states that will now be sort of prize assets for a, a tighter European Union, a European Union out of you know without the UK. There you can see some tensions, conflicts, uh, maybe they will not be completely hot or military, but you can, uh, I'm, I, I see that as a, as a zone for problems rather than the conventional Baltic states, although they like to make a lot of noise, uh, I know. It, 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 it's uh, profitable. Um, uh, Moskovsky Komsomol, it's a, I don't know, it's a tabloid, so. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I think it's now online, so it doesn't matter, but uh, it's, uh, we can speculate, yeah, maybe, maybe he will choose a, a, a beautiful exit and publicly marry his gymnast girlfriend. Um, well, that's my personal speculation. Uh, you know, that's, that's how the relationship has been kept quiet, so this, this provides a very beautiful, elegant, very understandable way out. And then Medvedev inherits, because he's seen a very, you know, the consensus view and the commentariat that he is the the ire, the, the kind of the the legacy partner. Uh, interesting, one of the early contenders for the uh, presidential post, um, which was Sergei Ivanov, 
uh, was recently ousted into a, he is now chief for environmental refurbishment somewhere, you know, and he was a mil military minister. Um, so I don't know, but I actually don't see it. Um, even if there is an official exit or a change, um, the, the presence will still be felt. It's not really, it's, it's not so much about the personality, it's what the personality uh, represents about the institutions. Uh, Alfredo, three questions. Sustainability of the national project. I'm not sure there is a national project. That's the whole point. Yes, economy is weak. Um, it's kind of possibly it, fa it fared better than everybody thought initially um, after sanctions were imposed. But there is no, no national project. Nobody is asking the annoying questions about, for example, demographics. The Russians are literally dying. There are simply not enough people being born. There are, you know, they die young. Um, there is a half of a country unpopulated that relies on migrant labor. It, it creates a whole pot of unsolved problems. Nobody's really tackling it. Um, um, there is also a, an issue that, okay, so if you are, even if you're original power, you're supposed to have good working relationships with the near abroad. But now, you know, if you look around, there are many unhappy people bordering Russia and it will go through generations. So what sort of national project? apart from rejuvenating some Soviet symbolism, can you offer them as a future, okay? So a lot of Russian project-wise, project, project -wise, it's all about the past and the past glory, but very little about the future. The person who tried to be about the future, Yeltsin or Gorbachev, they are both equally hated. I had one debate, he wasn't even a taxi driver, he was giving me a lift, but he is a professor in high school of economics, and all of a sudden he kind of, ah, I'm not sure who Russians hate more, Yeltsin or Gorbachev. Okay. Really? And it was, it was actually 2014. Um, Putin West conspiracy. I don't think it's a conspiracy by the West, by, but a completely lack of understanding. Um, and I guess maybe in practical terms, it means few staff working on Russian desks, you know, Russian studies or post-Soviet studies being not as glamorous as Middle Eastern uh, research. But it's a, did I press some? <laughs> Yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's a problem in foreign office, for example. They don't have enough people who know. Um, maybe initially it was a conspiracy when they didn't know what to make out of Gorbachev, um, but so long into the trend, it's just basically lack of engagement. Some countries are doing better than others, Italy or France, traditionally. Um, but, um, yeah. Putin regime. Uh, I would not, there is common rhetoric and it runs across popular academia of pers 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 personifying Putin with the country itself. And I wouldn't do it. I would simply call it authoritarian regime. And my argument goes back to 1998 when a financial crisis was essentially a crisis of, let me call it, neoliberalism in Russia where suddenly Russians really, really understood that they hate the idea of private property, they hate the idea of private wealth, they hated the oligarchs, they hated the Americans, they hated the spin doctors that did hate Yeltsin. So there was a very ample opportunity to create a Putin. So, you know, it happened to be this Putin, but actually it could have been anybody. So much less about him, although he, you know, he plays up to the role clearly, but it's, it's uh, it's traditionally an authoritarian state where, um, uh, apologies to all Russians or Slavs in the audience, a human value or a human being is absolutely worthless. And this is what the state, society or church will tell you through centuries. You as an individual, something that is so fundamental to Western capitalism and democracy, you're not worth anything. A bigger common objective, be that a, sta a, sta a revolution, war, a compatriot, a, uh, whatever, the national project, yes. But you as an individual are absolutely disposable. And um, that, that is the core of the problem. And I don't think it will take several generations to possibly start to challenge that. Okay, round two. <laughs> A gentleman here.
many broken promises. So what's your point? <laughs> All hope lies with Trump. <laughs> Okay, possibly, and less orange. Let's move to the second question and come back to this in, in afterwards. Yeah. One more question. Yeah, gentleman at the back. Okay, great. Um, okay, so Paul, did I answer your question? Yes, I did. Uh, graduates leaving, I think, um, I don't know what to say. The normal uh, considerations for, you know, demographers are, are running various charts historically where people start to leave the country and they do coincide with the economic crises. Um, mm -hmm. Part of it is a completely prof professional choice. So now Russian engineers will get more paid in Silicon Valley or somewhere else. And it's, it's an issue of globalization. They are fairly apolitical. They don't care. Um, they're, not, they're quite immune to you know, political organization, for example, the whole IT class. So they simply leave because the incomes have shrunk inside the country. Um, in terms of young people whose fathers are not oligarchs or you know, KGB people, I think it's a genuine concern. Um, because you know, they, now that the, the new owners of capital, they, the people who are in power, they have something that distinguishes them from Soviet elites. And that's something that you know, they can pass the wealth down officially. Your son or a nephew or a daughter can now be the new owner of your own, you know, let's say, in a little oil company. Something that the communist elites never had. So as that particular space shrinks, yes, there is a, a survival understanding. And maybe some of the middle classes, you know, I have these students. A lot of them are really anxious to go back after graduating from here. And I don't blame them. They, they, they are global citizens. They have, although some do share with the patriotic drive and the whole kind of rhetoric. Um, uh, I have to confess, I don't know about the trade deal in non-dollars. So. A source would be appreciated. 
I don't know. I would venture to believe that it's a small volume, and I, I wonder with, 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 with which country they actually signed. Um, Putin approached uh, China. Why does he need to approach China if he can just sell his own reserves of treasuries? He can start the onslaught himself. But also, why would he do that if all the reserves in all Russian sovereign wealth funds are denominated in dollars? So all these conspiracy theories, to me as a finance person, you know, they are quite, you know, really, really, you want to crush your own sovereign wealth fund, the dollar, which is the only, this is where they keep their wealth, okay? This is the chosen currency for safe haven. So I don't think the interests are not aligned with that. Uh, balancing act in the air, not necessarily in the air. Um, and there have been some initiatives to fatten up his own support base recently with the new security kind of guard being constructed, the national, the national guard that is only answerable to him. So presumably to counteract anything from more established uh, security agencies or maybe to help with any uprising or maybe to sort out Chechnya if necessary. Um, but I, I, I I don't have an interesting answer to that. He is a he, he has somebody who has grown into the role, and he's been used as the arbiter by you know existing power clans, but they have high vested stakes. And uh, it's funny, but a lot of highly educated people close to you know various elites, they still tell me, well, it's because he doesn't know. You know, if only he knew what's going on. You know, if. if it's, it's because they don't report to him or they lie to him. If really, if only it went up all the way, the problem will be solved. Great. Okay. Final round of questions, gentlemen up there. Great, thank you. Uh, any other? Yeah, this gentleman here. <laughs> Okay, and I saw one, uh, several hands up. Maybe over here. And people, yeah. Great. Should we try and fit the rest into it? See how many more hands there are? Just the gentleman here, yeah, okay.
questions? Yeah. Okay, uh, Putin and Puppet. Um, I think some of the elites would like very much to see him as a puppet, but I don't see that. He's also not a, a sole dictator. He makes decisions with some, with, with still a sense of being accountable, um, although it's not a, a not a Western type of accountability where you know nobody is above the law. Um, it's certainly you know Russia is ruled by law, but not what is it ruled by law, but not of law. So that's that's how it's described. Um, and then I guess I, I would finish. I'm not sure he's a visionary leader. He's also a leader who traditionally hasn't been that bothered with economics. He, he, he wants to, you know, he's, he's more of a big player guy sitting on the table with Merkel and Obama, but you know, economics is he's delegated to other people. So because of that, and he values loyalty. So loyalty is generated through giving access to a particular group or a family to a stream of income. So no, he's not entirely a puppet, but the kind of he's managing circumstances very cleverly. To what extent it's stretchable infinitely, I don't know. Um, he's certainly, you know, preempting a lot of a lot of dangers, or people around him, the loyal ones, are preempting a lot of potential dangers to him. And he, of course, has the massive popular support. Eighty percent rating is not something that you have easily. Um, there was also a basic question about uh, let's let me handle Eurasia. It's it's there. It's not even a scenario. It's already there. Um, but you know, in terms of being part of the global economy, it's absolutely insignificant. Together, they might make up less than three percent, I think, of the world market. And you know, you're talking about the world's largest country, and the world's ninth largest country being Kazakhstan, who I found out by personal research in Almaty doesn't produce its own shampoo; it imports shampoo from Russia. Okay, um, so you know, it gives you, and in fact, the. The country that has thrived in all this is my native Belarus, who actually did have a manufacturing base, industrial and human capital, and is exporting shampoo both to Russia and Kazakhstan, and also other stuff. Uh, uh, what is it? Basic question, what happened to all technology? Um, it's a little bit like, you know, in that Hollywood movie based on a true story about weapons of mass destruction, which turned out to be the scientist in Iraq. So a lot of that simply left. The brain drain in the 90s is the big trauma. And one anecdote has nothing to do with technology but with figure skating. Russians love winter sports, and in particular figure skating. And there was one particular championship, or maybe the Olympics, where suddenly all the medals were not taken by the Russians. Um, it was a massive national alarm. How come? Um, and now they started sort of public investigation. Turns out that all the coaches and trainers left. Uh, in the 90s, no children were going to the bases to be trained, and they realized this is now a, a capital loss of um, you know, enormous proportions that is important to the global superpower status. So that's just one example of you know, what was lost during the 90s. Um, underfunded, forgotten, sold, uh, revamped. So all the nice textbook theories of how you know, factory producing tanks will now be producing frying pans didn't really materialize. It was either there, forgotten, or still produces tanks, which is, of course, a major also export item. Um, and technology, you know, they're here. The people who are trained still are being trained by the generous uh, state supporting system of education. They, they work for corporations. If the Russian corporations pays, pays them more, maybe they will go back. But if it's an American or a European, they will go to either US yeah, or Europe. Depends. Physics, maths, yes. Uh, social sciences, no. Great. Okay, well, uh, I hope you will join me in a second in thanking Anastasia and also Matt for acting as discussant. Just quickly, before I leave you all, um, a plug for next week's event where we will be joined by uh, John Montgomery from Goldsmiths, who will be talking about is debt right off a viable solution to the crisis of financialization? Um, and also, the final week, so that's the 6th of December, we'll be hosting a panel on agrarian change, um, and that we have leaflets here advertising that, as well as giving you the full um, setup for, for next term. So, uh, I hope you'll join me in thanking both uh, Anastasia and Matt, and also um, join us in a reception, drinks reception now, in the senior common room over in the main building. So, thank you very much.